Well, good morning. I'd like to, I, I'm glad to see people in the sanctuary, sanctuary and those joining us virtually. We're so grateful to have you joining us in worship today. So once again, we're using the worship service that we've been using for the last couple of weeks, and we're going to uh, focus on connection when the world seems divided. Uh, the author, Dr. Marsha McPhee, writes this. She says, the root of the word human is the same as the word humility. It all means literally on the ground. From dust we came, and to dust we shall return. When we hear each other's fears, anxieties, and pain, we can return to the ground of hope that we are all experiencing the pain of being human. This week, we remember to look first at our neighbor as a person, not a position. Beginning conversations this way, she writes, may help us to stay human and on the ground with one another, rather than needing to come out on the top. The act of simply coming together is revolutionary, which is the, in its earliest form meant finding a course around a central point. We gather around the light of Christ as the center and guiding light of our lives. This becomes our point of reference for our relationships and our love in the world. This is our humility revolution. Let us pray. Creator God, we ask you to come close and remind us of our belovedness as your children. For we are our willing sins. Open our eyes to the beauty and pain we all contain. And invite us to do unto others in ways that build up your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the center of the world and in the power of the spirit that transforms. Amen.
Wait. Breathe. Let the anxiety take a break for just a moment. Breathe again. We are not alone. Christ is with us. Let us take a deep breath together. The rhythm of our breath and heartbeat is the same. Our desire for life and love is the same. Our desire for a peace in which we flourish is the same. Let this moment permeate our souls and let us pass the peace of Christ between us. This peace is meant for all people. The peace of Christ be with you. When my dad asked whether I wanted to say a few words about humility as part of the stewardship campaign, my initial thought was that I may not be the best choice. After all, 14-year-old boys are not well known for being humble. <laughs> and in some ways, this church community doesn't encourage my humility. I get so much support from the members of this church that it inflates my opinion of myself. But thinking about it more, I realized that my experience at UCF does in fact push me to think about things bigger than me. 
Sitting in the sanctuary for an hour on Sunday mornings is one of the few times in my week where I'm not just worrying about different things going on in my life and how they affect me. Instead, I think about the Christian message of helping others and not just focusing on my own problems. There are ways that our church helps to take that Christian message from inside this sanctuary out into our community. My family and I have participated with other UCF members in the service projects in the local area. We've prepared and served meals at the Samaritan Center and at Brown Memorial. These service projects are a wonderful way to foster humility. When I see the struggles that other people face in our community, it puts into perspective just how lucky I am. I also feel lucky to be a member of a church that encourages that type of community service. Thank you so much. Really well done. You know, sometimes, even if we find it hard to believe, we have to claim as truth that the gospel is really good news. Because together, we find ways to tell deeply good news to all people by filtering, just as we heard from Lila and Henry, our interactions, our relationships, our connections through humility. And today's scripture speaks of approaching one another with all humility, gentleness, and patience. What we put into the world is part of the ongoing creation of the world, part of the ongoing repair of the world, as our brothers and sisters who are Jewish would say. Notice that the scripture doesn't say that unity requires agreement, but rather that we are to cultivate the qualities that equip us to live in unity regardless of agreement. And isn't that part of what we need here in our society today in this wonderful experiment in the United States called democracy? Can we begin to believe this is even possible? Hear these words that Paul wrote to the people of Ephesus. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and parent of all who is above all and through all and in all. A word of God for our times. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, open our lives that we may respond to the call of the early church, to the call ascribed to Paul, to the call embodied in Jesus Christ, so that we might follow the path Christ has called us to and continues to call us to, that we might walk indeed with a humble and gentle spirit, that we might show love and respect to one another, that we might be woven together in peace as we dance together in that great circle of life, joined together in one body, by one spirit, to follow one purpose, to love one another, to love our God, and to love ourselves. This prayer we offer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Humility is a tough conversation, as Henry said, to have in our day and time. It's not encouraged in a lot of ways. In the midst of a political campaign, it's not heard, right? In fact, most candidates would argue that humility does not serve them well on the campaign trail. It disappears since the can candidates spend millions, millions, supporting 
ads and all kinds of different ways for us to hear about successes and plans, much like the ancient Roman emperors did when Jesus was alive, carving all their successes on the doors of their mausoleums. Our society rewards and votes for often and encourages this trumpeting of achievement, doesn't it? But also, there's a little ambivalence about this practice, isn't it? Think for a second about our recent trend of fact-checking or accusations in the schoolyard about bragging and not being able to back it up. The church struggles as well, historically, culturally, individually. Church growth methods, anything you want to buy that talks about how to transform your church from a congregation of 50 to a congregation of 15,000 is going to encourage that church to celebrate and lift up the congregation's achievements. And it's not a bad thing, I don't think, to celebrate and lift up our achievements or what we've done. But some, like adherence to the prosperity gospel, equate those achievements with instant success in society's term. Some, like some preachers in megachurches, talk about numerical growth as a measure of faith. At the same time, the church preaches and hopefully practices humility as a characteristic, a virtue, of individual disciples, even of an all-powerful and all-knowing God, embodied in Jesus, imitated by the disciples through the power of the Spirit. It's it really confusing. And Henry and Lila did a great job of drawing a straight line between the reality of service, service and what that does in terms of our perspective and the practice of humility. And they did that all without claiming to be humble, which is a good call. Because once you claim to be humble, you know, you say you got first place in humility, it kind of defeats the whole thing. This passage from Paul's letter is, a, is the turning point, the central switch in Paul's writing from the celebration of an inclusive faith where the Gentiles are included and adopted as children of Christ to the practice of that faith. He lifts up the humble and gentle spirit and then talks more about love, patience, respect, peace, and unity. Remember that in Greek and Roman rhetoric and poetry that's used by our brothers and sisters in the Psalms, we see phrases, and each phrase deepens our understanding of the previous phrase. So when we think about a humble and gentle spirit, Paul pushes us to think what underlies and makes that possible, the characteristics of love, patience, and respect to our neighbors. And Paul pushes us again to say, well, what does that look like in the world? It looks like peace, wholeness, and unity. Characteristics that we've thought about when we've thought about the fruits of the Spirit. It's interesting that humility was not really a characteristic or a virtue in Greek and Roman culture at all. Honor, with a slight side of modesty, was indeed celebrated, but not humility. Humility was despised. It wasn't something you wanted to be, because humility in that culture meant that you were really down in the dirt, the literal meaning. You were so poor that the average Roman citizen would step over you, like the untouchables that we've heard about from a Hindu caste system, and we've heard about 
in lots of different societies, including ours, where we think about how indigenous people were not even considered human in many of the early colonial writings and church decrees, as well as slaves that were a little more human, three quarters, and women weren't even talked about. Humility was not something that was cultivated or lifted up as a virtue. In fact, in the 19th century, when the whole of economics was beginning to switch and become more focused on capitalism as a founding principle, philosophers spent pages and pages arguing about whether humility as a virtue was even worth thinking about in a capitalist society. Was it even a functional piece? Derided as a monk's special virtue, many philosophers encouraged people not to be humble. If you want to succeed in a society that's founded on capitalism, that works through capitalism, you can't be humble, according to some philosophers. But the early disciples, as Marsha McPhee lifted up, began a humility revolution. Because they had to wrestle with the stark reality of a crucified God. And remember, in Roman society, crucifixion was the worst way to die, completely humiliated. So what did it mean that the person they followed, that the God they understood as loving them, died on a cross? That life and that relationship was so compelling broke the bonds of death so completely, upended the understanding of society so totally that disciples and many early Christian writers claimed humility was the first founding virtue of discipleship. That emphasis in larger society on honor and modesty was countered by humility. And in these times, a healthy dose of humility is perhaps something we might want to think about. Intellectually, humility is not often lifted up, is it? And yet for most of us, or many of us, I would argue that my experience reading different authors and writers from different cultures and discipline if nothing else, hammers humility through my brain. And I use that term literally because sometimes my brain does need to be cracked open from its sense of being certain that I know what's going on. For me, at least, it happened in college, those first encounters with people who I hadn't grown up with and writers that were from places far, far away. That lifelong love of fiction and poetry continued to chip away at any sense of certainty. And as experience and life continued to kick me in the pants, I knew that any hope I had of always having the truth was iffy at best. Because the truth is that we need all the voices. That's what the church says. We need all the parts of the body. We need all the different ideas together for us to discern God's voice. Just like when we sing, just like when we build, just like when we cook, we need all those different flavors and voices and sounds and notes in order for the melody and the harmony, for the food to reach that exquisite taste, for the building to stand, for us to truly hear what God is calling us to do. More and more folks have studied humility 
in uh, the psychological disciplines and in behavioral disciplines, right? And, and, and what do we discover? Humility, in some ways, creates an honest awareness of our strengths, not an inflated awareness, right? But an honest awareness of our strengths and certainly an honest and sometimes embarrassed awareness of our shortfalls and failings. I know I can list so many ways that I have messed up, that I have fallen short, that I have not done what I hope and hoped to do. And you all have seen them. They're little sometimes, right? Let's see, coming in at hmm, one minute of the service. Or perhaps remembering, oh yeah, I need readers. And getting them in the middle of the service. And y'all are wonderfully accepting and wonderfully gracious for those kind of small failings that at least are part of my aging brain and sometimes overcommitted life. And I truly do appreciate that. Those are little examples, and I'm too embarrassed to share the big ones. <laughs> Certainly not on YouTube. Not happening. You'll have to Google. I'm sure it's somewhere. It's hard. It's hard for us to live with our limitation, and yet, in some ways, the virtue of humility is a gift. Because not only do we know what we can do and try, we're also pretty aware of what we can't do. And that's so important because it opens us, just as intellectual op humility opens us, to other ideas, other gifts, other strengths. So that when I try to lift a mattress by myself, I could have done that at 21, not so much at 64. I need help. I don't like it. Humility is not a virtue I want. Humility is not a virtue much of anybody wants in our society today, but it's interesting to me. And in fact, probably one of the ways that I am most opened to the benefits of humility when I think about artistic expression. Now that may seem odd. You know, we've talked about intellectual humility, which makes a world of sense, right? We talked about the reality of behavior where we succeed and fail. We talked a little bit about how our society is organized, but it seems to me that artists, whether they are musicians or poets, <coughs> writers or visual artists in some ways teach us about humility in ways that cuts right to our hearts. And what is so intriguing about that as a person who has artists in her family is generally artists aren't humble. In fact, most art schools would say they're trying to teach them how not to be humble. They're trying to teach many artists how to be self-centered. I heard that at a series of awards from Syracuse University in their visual and performing arts program. One of the professors said, we failed with this particular student. She never learned how to be self-centered. She thought about other people, and that's reflected in her artwork. And I realize whether the artistic medium is a movie, a television show, a symphony, those are the artists that come at me slant and break my heart open. Think for a moment, think for a moment in our separated and sometimes unconnected world, that moment when the reality of the destruction of war became apparent if you were growing up during the Vietnam War, 
we were sitting here in the United States, but once the television screens showed what happened, once the photographers had pictures of children suffering, it changed how we saw what seemed like an abstract but important conflict between freedom and communism. Think for a moment about the songs of the civil rights movement and how we shall overcome sung with multiple voices moves our hearts in ways we can't really describe. Think for a moment about sculptures and stained glass, about the architecture of different sanctuaries and how they put us in perspective. Think for a moment about the pictures that are all over the web of galaxies millions of years away and if that doesn't make us recognize how small and insignificant we are in the great scheme of life, I'm not sure what will. Those clouds of stardust reaching out and looking like God's fingers in the distance. Huge, hard to understand difficult to quantify, and yet beautiful. Break our hearts open. And that's what humility is for. It seems to me that the beginning of the Christian journey is to have our hearts broken open, to recognize that we can't do it all ourselves, to see, in fact, that God is in charge, to know that our voice is not the only voice or always the right voice, to see and to understand truly that our culture doesn't have a corner on the right way to do things. And to begin to listen and learn and appreciate and come together as one with all those differences. The gift of humility encourages us to remember that even small places, even places where the numbers don't meet any church growth metric in a significant way, those small acts of service, those small moments when we say, you know, I never thought of it that way, those small opportunities, where that particular chord or color or image changes us. Those are the places where God's voice is in this day and time, and we, as a church, we, as a community of disciples, are called to witness to those moments. Not to say we have a corner on them, but to witness to what we see. God working in our world still today. God providing hope in our world still today. God providing opportunities even for 14-year-old boys and I would argue 17-year-old girls who are extremely talented to recognize that there is a whole world out there full of wonderful things that God has given us to celebrate, to learn from, and to open our heart to. May it be so here and now and in the future, because God still believes in us. Hallelujah. Amen.
A writer and designer of this particular worship series writes, Dr. McPhee says, Jesus' ministry turned the idea of social stratification on its head. Our response to the invitation of Christ to be his body in the world is to make these alternative sacred narratives more real in our lives for the sake of the world. We come to prayer today as the populace, a word whose French origins in the 16th century meant the multitude of persons not distinguished by rank, education, office, or profession, and perhaps political party. We are people first, the populace, not positions. And so we pray together the prayers of the people, for we are all human, humus of the earth, before we were anything else. We pray for a sense of connection for ourselves and others. We pray for a setting aside of ego for ourselves and others. We pray for the spiritual capacity of humility for ourselves and others. We pray for the relief from fear for ourselves and others. Holy, loving, and egalitarian God, we ask that in this world, you would indeed give us the gift of humility that we might recognize that there is more, more than one beloved child of God. We are all God's beloved children. That there is more than one person called to follow Christ. We are all called to follow Christ. That there is more than one person given the gifts of the Spirit, for we are all given gifts. And they are many and varied. Beloved God, we ask, even as we pray to you and give thanks for the gift of humility and the other gifts of the Spirit, gentleness, patience, love, peace, unity. We are mindful of the places in our world where those gifts do not seem readily apparent. We especially ask that you would be with our brothers and sisters throughout the Southeast who have been battered by Hurricane Helene. We ask that you would be with those who are stranded, who have lost loved ones, who have lost their homes, who are looking just for a little bit of power to turn the lights on, who aren't sure they can get from one place to another and get the help they need. Open the eyes of those who are relief workers here in our nation, as well as those around the world. Those who are seeking to provide relief in places torn by war. We especially remember our brother, brothers and sisters in Israel, in Lebanon, and in Gaza. We remember our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine and Russia, in Sudan, and in Haiti. And in all those places, that the news doesn't cover. We remember that the United States is not the only place where flooding occurs. And there are natural disasters around our world that have far fewer resources to respond, open our eyes to the needs of our whole world, remind us of the ways we have been blessed. We pray for our nation, we pray with gratitude for football games that don't break out in fights just because candidates come. We pray that the divisions that have plagued us for the last several years might find ways to be healed, that we might listen and learn from one another, that we might remember that we are one nation, we pray for those who are seeking to serve as leaders in our nation, that they might speak words of healing and peace, that they might remind us of our best selves and our best ideals. We pray for the church that is discouraged by dwindling resources and dwindling numbers of folks, by folks who question its very existence. 
help us to remember that in those questions might be indeed the seeds of resurrection. Remind us that the church is always changing, but your love is never changing. Remind us that you have given us so much. And our call is not to keep it tight, but to open our hands and share it with those in need so that we might truly show the world our love of neighbor. Gracious God, we pray for those in our congregation who are grieving and ill, especially for those who have lost loved ones. We pray for the Clutton family. We pray for the Myers family. We pray for all who are struggling to recover, who wrestle with sadness and grief, for whom every death reminds us of other deaths and losses, for whom every trip to the doctor reminds us of other friends who have been ill. We pray that we might recognize that in the sadness and sorrow of life, there is also great joy and love. For sadness and sorrow are simply, in some ways, our frustration at not being able to express the love and give thanks for all we've received. We pray for ourselves that we might indeed continue to serve you with all that you have given us. Humble us that we might be open to the voice of your spirit, calling us to the next faithful step. This prayer we offer in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray together saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen. Let us bring our gifts to God.
a family to belong to. We ask that you would encourage us to use the gifts you have given us to welcome a world that feels isolated and alone, to remind them of your love, to witness through our actions and through our words that indeed the great good news is we are chosen and called by a loving God to serve. This prayer we offer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So folks, I want to remind you there are lots of sign-ups right outside the front door. So if you start to run from the back door, I'm going to know that you're trying to avoid those sign-ups. And I really want to encourage you to turn around because Next week is Church in the World Sunday, and we have some great opportunities to serve together. We have plenty of folks, however, to wrap diapers, I just want to say. And we have lots of diapers, which is good. But we really need some folks to help in our other service opportunities. We need a couple of folks to help with the food pantry. Um, not a lot, right, because it's not a big space. But a couple of folks to go with Kevin to help with the food pantry. We need more folks to go to the Samaritan Center where they're counting on us to serve. And I understand that they've been able to hire some staff. So Betsy said we would be serving food and having a chance to visit. And normally, how many folks do we take, Betsy, when we do that? Do you know? Yeah. That's okay, I just wanted to get a rough idea. So we want at least eight to do that. And Scott and I have made the great sacrificial call that if there aren't enough people signing up for the Samaritan Center, we will give up our much beloved highway work. <laughs> this weekend and this weekend only. And then we'll ask all of you to join us on another Saturday because we want at least 12 of us out there collecting the trash. Because if nothing else makes you humble, it's collecting the trash or, frankly, moving a run-over squirrel out of the middle of the road. Blech. Yeah, that's an exercise in humility, I'm telling you. Boo. So please sign up for sure for the Samaritan Center and FM, and if those fill up, um, Come on over to the highway. Scott and I will be happy to go with you. Um, we'll even take first shot at the squirrels, right, Scott? So it's all good. And there's so many wonderful opportunities that I hope you will join us. And, and invite your friends. Other friends can come. Invite other families that haven't been able to join us. The good news is the sermon will be incredibly short and so that we can get to work. So if folks have said, I don't wanna go, they talk too long, or the service is too long, or the prayers are too long, this is the service <laughs> to invite your friends to. Because we're not gonna just talk, we're gonna do. We have, as you know, Dave Clutton's funeral today at two with calling hours at one, and so Kevin and I had a chance to put our, our heads together, and Sarah, I didn't have a chance to touch base with you, I'm sorry, but I think we're gonna postpone the sacred conversations. I'm concerned that, um, certainly for me, I'm not gonna be able to listen as carefully as I would like, because I'll be thinking about the two o'clock service, um, and I don't think I can avoid doing that. Um, it's important to honor the family and to honor Dave's life. So I also wanna honor our conversations. So I appreciate your flexibility. I'm just gonna say that in advance. And I should have thought of that earlier this week, but you know what? I still think I'm 21. I'm sorry. Um, I'll remember that I'm not soon, or God will make sure I fall on my face enough that I remember earlier. Um, we do have fellowship after church. Is there anything else I've missed for the good of the community? All right, so actions create ripples. Throw a pebble in a pond and you see all those ripples, right? And we move into the world praying that the results of our work 
will create actions of humility that extend far beyond anything we might imagine or know. And so let's see what we can do. Let's keep understanding what it means to do unto others so that the effects of kindness, the effects of humility and respect and love continue to ripple out into our community. Let's join together in our closing song. May the Holy One show you the way to do unto others with compassion. May the Christ whose light is the center of all that is ground you in the assurance that no one is outside of love. And may the Spirit show forth through you in extraordinary acts you never imagined you had the power to achieve. May you know that the peace that surpasses all understanding, especially when it's difficult to understand. And the people said together, Amen.
Thank you.